The Century of Chinese Corporatism, written by Riza Hazmath. Introduction. Since its foundation in 1949, the People's Republic of China has engaged with corporatism as a model for organizing societal interests. China's corporatist elements, misunderstood as they often are by foreign observers, help to explain its economic successes and political resiliency. In the Anglo-American imagination, however, corporatism usually calls to mind the authoritarian or fascist dictatorships of the early 20th century, and corporatism is often wrongly thought to be wholly incompatible with liberal democracies. While it is true that corporatism was co-opted as a strategy of choice by non-democratic regimes such as Mussolini's Italy and Salazar's Portugal, it has also been successfully used in many different forms by post-World War II democratic governments including the United Kingdom, the Netherlands, Germany, Sweden, and Japan. In the late 1980s, the democratic presidential candidates Gary Hart and Michael Dukakis even suggested corporatism as a potential model for managing and mediating organized labor. Robert Reich, the Secretary of Labor during the Clinton administration, suggested the same. More recently, it has become something of truism that U.S. leaders have misunderstood China and misjudged its political trajectory over the last few decades. Just as they have been caught off guard by many important political and economic developments in the West. Part of the explanation for both failures is that American politicians have ignored the insights of corporatism and have difficulty embracing corporatist models at home or abroad, whether in democratic or non-democratic contexts. In its most basic form, corporatism seeks to organize society into associations based on common interests, like business and labor, that work together to achieve harmonious results. The corporatist project is not a socialist one per se, nor, on the other hand, is it laissez-faire capitalism. Instead, as Alan Cawson once put it, corporatism offers a certain set of institutional mechanisms and structures in service of the state that can be applied across a wide spectrum of political regime types. In his own words, Corporatism is a socio-political process in which organizations representing monopolistic functional interests engage in political exchange with state agencies over public policy outputs, which involves those organizations in a role that combines interest representation and policy implementation through delegated self-enforcement. Or, as Philip Schmitter, the contemporary grandfather of corporatist theory, writes, Corporatism is a system of interest representation in which the constituent units are organized into a limited number of singular, compulsory, non-competitive, hierarchically ordered, and functionally differentiated categories, recognized or licensed, if not created by the state, and granted a deliberate, representational monopoly within their respective categories in exchange for observing certain controls on their selection of leaders and articulation of demands and supports. One of the essential elements of corporatism is that the state recognizes one association as the representative of a sector's interests. The state forms a partnership with the association, which generally occurs as a two-way relationship. The association is often asked for its position on current and prospective policies, as well as assistance to implement and execute policies. The aim of corporatist models is to organize key segments of society into singular associations that mediate their members' interests. Even in the United States, many such associations already exist. A chamber of commerce, for instance, will represent business interests of all sizes and regions. This is how the U.S. Chamber of Commerce aptly describes its mission to represent the interests of more than 3 million U.S. businesses. 
Similarly, consider the example of the American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organizations, in brackets AFL-CIO, a federation of 55 unions representing more than 12 million working individuals, whose mission is to broadly advocate for labor rights. The problem for nations without a corporatism model is that the direct mechanisms for engaging such associations in productive negotiation and collaboration, and for enlisting their assistance in implementing the government's policies and goals, often do not exist. Lacking a corporatist framework, pluralist systems use a model of organizing and relating interest groups. This is characterized by divisive competition and conflict between various associations. Not only is such conflict tolerated, it is actively encouraged. Under pluralism, when the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organizations are at odds with each other, as it often happens, one of their primary strategies is to bargain and lobby in a conflictual manner toward an outcome that may not fully please either side or serve the nation's overarching interests. Indeed, such conflict can often lead to suboptimal policy choices, particularly when viewed from the standpoint of the nation as a whole. In addition, the pluralist competitive model can also engender distrust and even alienation among members of conflicting associations while causing ambient distrust among the public. By contrast, the goal of corporatism is to encourage organized consensus and cooperation toward outcomes that serve the national interests. Corporatist models suggest that aggressive competition and conflict between organized interests is not necessarily required for optimal outcomes. When considering China, we must keep in mind that corporatism is not intended to be a complete account of the Chinese regime. Rather, it is an important and, in the West, often overlooked element that has changed and adapted through a number of different periods. In China's Maoist phase, from the early 1950s to mid-1970s, corporatism took the form of an aggressive, state-led effort to organize every aspect of society from the top down. But contrary to the expectations of some observers, particularly those subscribing to core neoliberal tenets, corporatism remained an element of market reforms under Deng Xiaoping, Jian Zemin, and Hu Jintao, and remains an important element of policy, philosophically and pragmatically, under the current regime shepherded by Xi Jinping. All told, since 1949, China has tried a large number of successful and not-so-successful corporatist experiments. What these phases have in common is a state corporatist, top-down approach, albeit with shifting degrees of state involvement, and, in the present era, a snail's pace effort towards building a societal corporatism, bottom-up, terms that I describe further below. Over the same period, we have also witnessed a shift from a centrally controlled corporatist state to one in which the local state has a greater space to implement corporatist techniques, allowing the formation of business and professional associations at the local level, and providing them a space for local state-directed bargaining. As China embarks on its next decade, a consideration of Chinese corporatism is useful in two respects. First, foreign corporations and governments who engage in China particularly if they come from pluralist competitive societies, tend to misunderstand the nexus of businesses, organizations, and the state. They wrongfully presume that state direction and corruption are synonymous. A more nuanced understanding of Chinese corporatism, however, leads to an important second point, that some lessons learned by Chinese experiments in corporatism during the very period of its ascent to becoming an economic superpower may be beneficial for foreign policymakers considering paths to a more stable public life. Section 2. From State Corporatism to Societal Corporatism? 
At its beginning, 70 years ago, the People's Republic of China fashioned its corporatist template from the Soviet Union which, earlier in the 20th century, had instilled corporatist elements into all of the Soviet state. The key premise behind the Soviet and the then burgeoning Chinese model was that varying associational interests could achieve societal harmony with the state front and center. As the state led the Soviet Union and China through industrialization, the idea was that the state would be, would be the guardian of the common good and of the national interest that supersedes the parochial interests of each constituency. In this approach, commonly called state corporatism, the Chinese state sought to develop close institutional arrangements with large associations in society. In a socialist state such as China in the early 1950s, this project was rather difficult. In the early years of the People's Republic of China, the CCP had effectively destroyed what existed of the private business sector, and virtually all industry was state-led under a socialist command economy, Zedong, and the CCP controlled associations called mass organizations that represented all the major social groups. Workers, for example, joined the All-China Federation of Trade Unions. Youths joined the Communist Youth League of China, and women joined the All-China Women's Federation. This hard form of state corporatism was effectively a one-way, top-down transmission system between the CCP controlled government and the masses, rather than a two-way conduit for grassroots interests to reach the CCP leadership. This hard form of statism underwent a profound shift in the late 1970s to a soft form when the Chinese state engaged in large structural market reforms, which at least at a surface level fostered a relaxation of the CCP's control over society. Neoliberal anal analysts, anal analysts outside of China, hoping for a universal shift towards pluralist forms of association, expected at a basic level the relaxation of state authority to result in a simpler system of free association. The shift from a hard to soft form of state corporatism did not, ye corporatism did not yield these expected results. Rather, it is best understood as a movement from overt to tacit sanctioning of interest associations, with the state holding a firm grasp on mediating societal interests. Previously, under a hard form of state corporatism and propaganda to compel individuals and organizations to act in the best interests of society. In post-market reform China, the state continued its key role as a coordinator of associations working towards a common goal, primarily utilizing tacit sanction. In this approach, associations are allowed to function on their own as a substitute of the state with some important caveats. With the assumption that a conflictual competitive system will hold back national economic priorities and damage the social fabric, the tacit sanctioning framework chanted by the CCP followed this typical setup. One, the state creates and maintains the relationship between organizations. Two, Select organizations and groups are granted the privilege to mediate interests on behalf of their constituents before the state. And three, these organizations and groups must adhere to the rules and regulations established by the state. Mechanisms like these are now employed to bridge potential gaps between the state and society. For instance, in dealing with the new red capitalists, Party members who have built successful private shift in state society relationships in China should not be understated. Prior to the market reform era, virtually all enterprises were directly under state ownership. By the early 1990s, Deng Xiaoping declared an explicit policy of grasping the large state-owned grasping the large state-owned enterprises and letting the small go in order to encourage market competition. While the central government retained control of the most strategically important state-owned enterprises, adopting a commanding heights model, it relinquished control over the smaller ones. Although the central government has shown a reluctance 
to definitively label the industries belonging to the commanding heights due to the political sensitivity of the issue, these industries are generally thought to include defense, the power grid, petroleum and petrochemicals, telecommunications, civil aviation, and shipping. By 1993, seven of China's industrial ministries had been eliminated, and the majority of these ministries were transformed into associations. For example, the Ministry of Light Industries and the Ministry of Textiles. Textiles. The industries closest to the national interest thus remain guided by the state, while a considerable degree a free activity is permitted in other areas where central direction is less necessary or efficient. Far from leading to a general decline of corporate era of pioneering strategies to employ corporatist practices, the implications of these actions were twofold. First, while the state stepped back from its early hard form of state corporatism, it retained indirect control of the affairs of associations with an eye toward maintaining economic advancement and, advancement and social stability. Among the seven industrial ministries eliminated in the 1990s, for example, the majority of officials from these ministries were transferred to the new associations. Rather than simply fully tearing down the ministries, the previous forms of government entered in a new arrangement. The associations were thus able to retain their allegiance, trust, and close relationship with the government. Second, the shift towards a soft state corporatism provided a space in which the local state could restructure, privatize, or shut down state-owned enterprises. In effect, China had shifted to a more sophisticated federalist corporatism. As China entered the World Trade Organization, and during the even greater liberalization of China's economy in the 2010s, Many analysts and scholars imagine that China a form of corporatism that could be enforced voluntarily, a societal corporatism, so to speak. The society-led form of corporatism was commonly found in other East Asian nations, such as Japan and South Korea, which had already, more or less, transitioned from a state to societal corporatism. In a societal corporatist framework, institutionalized bargaining between an association's interests and the wider public's interests is shaped from bottom-up, grassroots efforts rather than the top-down model proper to state-led corporatism. Many analysts hoped that Chinese business associations hoped that Chinese business associations and labor unions would begin to behave more like those in other East Asian countries and be primarily influenced by their grassroots constituent members. Notwithstanding to suggest that there is, or about to be, a transition from state to societal core point, the guiding overarching philosophy and approach of the Communist Party of China and the current Xi Jinping government is one in which the state will be the final arbitrator of institutional relations, whether through overt sanctioning or tacit sanctioning. Even if a weaker or more fragmented form of corporatism comes to pass, the state is still, strictly speaking, the ultimate entity that mediates Chinese society's larger interests. The reasons China has held on to forms of state corporatism become evident when we consider how market liberalism played out at the local level. Section 3. The Local Corporatist State While the CCP-controlled state has shaped every major aspect of contemporary Chinese society, the growing liberalization of the economy and the increasing complexity of social issues suggest that the state is retreating from an array of social problems. Yet, a survey of China's political landscape today shows that this analysis does not fully reflect reality. Not only is the central state playing an active and critical role in managing social problems, but the local state has become an, um, an important actor. In fact, it is the local state that has emboldened itself to engage with actors such as business associations 
and non-governmental organizations. China's decentralization from the mid-1990s to the early 2010s heightens the need, heightens the need to factor in the role of the state at the subnational level. Local states were given and expected to make a wide range of decisions, as well as take on added responsibilities for managing social needs. This led to hopes that a societal corporatism would emerge at the local level. For example, when looking at investigations into China's anti-dam movements and the role of NGOs in this process, in particular the Three Gorges Dam and the Nuzhing movements, one eager analyst observed that society's ability to challenge the local state intensified. In another case, when analyzing the behavior of homeowners associations at the subnational level, their contentious behavior suggests that thinking of China in a societal corporatist framework could be apt. Since such associations were provided an opportunity to organize at a grassroots level, resist and pressure the local government. While the local state did not engage with societal actors, the local state was driven by self-interest and in true state corporatist fashion, picked strategic winners of certain industries to back. There was little room for a full-blown societal corporatism, although there were glimpses of this playing out as the anti-dam movements and the Home Owners Association examples suggests. The local state in many ways became an important economic actor, for instance, urban and rural industrialization relied on the local state as a business corporation. Local officials were portrayed as entrepreneurs, fostering business opportunities, mobilizing resources, and other agencies within the local state to nurture selected business enterprises. Fiscal reforms provided incentives for local officials to actively promote local industry and economic development of their own region since they had residual claimants' rights over enterprise profits, although national regulations stipulated no more than 20% of after-tax profits could be claimed by the local government. At a more nuanced level, there was an intimate relationship between banks, finance, and tax offices, and township and village authorities, whereby each would assist the other to maximize revenues. Irrespective of the fact the local state was broadly, broadly entrepreneurial and productive in facilitating economic reform, the pursuit of individual gain by the local officials was built into the system, along with the potential for local officials to be rent-seekers and predatory. Even though local associations' activities appear to be corporatist on paper, the pursuit of local interests provokes a larger and important question. What happens if, happens if the local corporatist state's interests are at odds with the central corporatist state's interests? Normally, corporatism is predicated on fostering organized consensus and cooperation between associations, representing society, and the state with an explicit goal of serving the larger national interests. What happens if the interests at the subnational level are at odds with the national one? Arguably, it was just such a state of affairs that Xi Jinping inherited when he came to power in the mid-2010s. Decentralization and the wavering shift towards hybrid pseudo-societal corporatism did not necessarily lead to the optimal outcomes. In many cases, the local state was forced to act in a corporatist manner for the sake of economic efficiency and social harmony. But the result had been a rise in local corruption and a disjunct between the local state and national priorities. Xi's response was a vast and swift anti-corruption campaign that was used as a rubric to re-centralize power in the central government's hands. Contrary to the dominant impressions uttered in Western media, the goal was not a power grab pure and simple, rather having the national interests and not local ones take precedence. To wit, the shift towards societal corporatism had begun to show some of the results commonly associated with pluralist systems, local dysfunction and a lack of national coordination to achieve society's meta goals and interests. In the end, understanding the local state's interactions with society through a corporatist framework 
is useful since there is strong evidence that social and economic interests are equally desirous of a, co of a corporatism that accommodates their presence in politics. In other words, corporatism is not some sort of corruption of the natural, pluralist state of affairs. Rather, different interests that encounter one another naturally seek to coordinate their negotiations through governmental authorities. Nevertheless, taken to an extreme, a local corporatist runs the risk of a fragmented state. In effect, the state is pulled in different directions. On the one hand, the local state forges ties with one section of society, and on the other hand, the local state forms ties with a different, perhaps competing, segment of society. To temper this risk, the central state, as the guardian of the national interest, will most likely intervene to reassert its power and influence if the fragmentation of the local state becomes untenable. Again, the need to respond to this situation may partially explain Qi's efforts to reset centralized bureaucratic power in the hands of the central state. Section 4 and the concluding section, The Lessons of Chinese Corporatism As China's global ascendancy matures into the middle of the 21st century, marking nearly a hundred years of practicing corporatism, U.S.-based actors need to become better equipped to understand and navigate the central and local corporatist state in China. This need is especially vital, considering the increasing friction among American businesses operating in China and in a climate of ongoing U.S.-China trade disputes. For the most part, we continue to see U.S. actors misunderstanding indigenous Chinese businesses is corporatist relationship with the central and local state. This misunderstanding is reflected in how U.S.-based actors seek to influence China's domestic policymaking via Western interest group lobbying techniques. This approach is a curiosity from afar since overt and open political bargaining or lobbying outside of the bureaucratic state structure is generally against the rules of success in the Chinese corporatist context. Although pluralist competitive lobbying has proved fruitful on occasion, it is widely perceived as an oddity in China, and Chinese authorities seldom concede vital elements of the policy-making process to private interest groups. Chinese associations generally try to influence policy decision-making through mutual, harmonious agreement rather than open opposition and confrontation. Understanding the inner workings and operations of the Chinese corporatist state and its complex relationship with societal associations allow actors to better influence the state so long as the goals sought are congruent with the overall national interest. This harmony is the true ethos of corporatism, and it is a lesson that actors embedded in political life should seek to understand with greater appreciation. Understanding state society relations in China through a corporatist lens allows us to better engage with the nuances and motivations of the state. It allows us to analytically examine changes that have occurred within the Chinese state structure vis-a-vis -vis society as a result of economic reforms. One can reasonably suggest that the process of economic liberalization has modified the tools the central and local state has adopted to manage the economy and society. It has moved from an over-reliance on tools of coercion and propaganda to the current tacit sanctioning strategy of developing stronger, intimate ties with the main actors of society to ultimately enable the state to mediate societal interests. Corporatism, whether state-centric or societal, suggests that organized consensus and cooperation is needed rather than a competitive and conflictual bargaining process. Harmony is paramount in this conception, whether a model or in a bottom-up, grassroots societal form. National goals and interests take primacy over the local state or associational interests. A corporatist relationship thus invites deep trust by the citizenry and members of the respective associations that the state is trying to mediate, balance, and execute a variety of interests.
It is therefore not surprising that Chinese citizens and associations continue to have a high degree of trust in the central state. The fact that many of the association members are CCP members or former state government officials who have an intimate understanding of the organizational behavior of the state helps in this process. In the United States, by contrast, trust in government is at a historic low. According to the latest Pew survey, only 17% of Americans trust the federal government to do what is right. Just about always, 3%, or most of the time, is at 14%. A pluralistic system predicated on competing interest groups who lobby the state does not invite the requisite trust necessary for a fruitful partnership between state and associations representing society. Suffice to say, declining institutional trust is a major problem in the current environment and likely will remain one for the foreseeable future. Americans may need to engage with corporatist models not simply to better understand China, but to deal with even greater challenges at home.